This was an idea of Andrew's, who has, for the summer, a recording machine. I like the idea very much, but it puts a tremendous burden of ingenuity and improvisatory power upon the speaker. That makes me feel very odd with you, because we've, uh, for many years now, seen each other only very intermittently. And yet, with many years between each seeing, we have always resumed a conversation as if I had just gone into Suwanee. And that has been one of the really greatest delights of my friendship with you. Now I have to go it alone, and there's nothing that you can say, and that may leave me rather helpless at times. However, the only way that one can go about this is from precisely where one is. I was awfully disappointed that in the long run you didn't get up this summer. I'd heard about it. I thought it was simply a wonderful idea. I would love to see you in New York and that uh, all of us could go to whatever plays and concerts and galleries, everything of the kind there might be around. I hope that will happen still, but God knows when it will. I'm in a mess just now, rather tired still with finishing one job and uh, trying to decide among some others which I will have to begin within the next few weeks. The job I was doing was one I believe would interest you. And I wish that we could spend an evening. I could go over the screenplay I wrote about it. It was about Paul Gauguin. And my sense of how to write about him was not as the criminal romantic that he's often set up, but as uh, a man who's vocation was like a lure set out by God, that everyone has a different lure, and his was a very deep passion for painting, and that it take him the rest of his life from when he first felt that vocation very deeply to find that it was not the, not the real thing even, but only the lure. And that all it was trying to teach him was to be as absolutely faithful to his own soul and his own being as he could. And that he find out the price of that as he went along. And there's a good deal of it that I, that I feel very well about, and that I, I wish I could show you. These new things, I'm, I, I feel silly talking about the jobs, but they, they're occupying me so, because I simply have got to make a choice, and I can't. One of the new jobs would take me to the Philippine Islands, where I would love to go, and would be with two good friends, one a Filipino, who is very experienced in making movies there on very little money, and is a, a good actor, a movie star. The other is a Chinese named James Wong Hao, who is, I think, the finest cameraman in movies now. I've had the good fortune to become friends of both people, and I know what, what fun we would have working on it, and also how much I would learn I would learn in that way as one never could through a simple, straight business arrangement. It would be a kind of fantastic and almost fairy story kind of piece of work. It would be done on an incredible amount of money. Even in this country it would be large, three million dollars. There you multiply that between five and six, and you would get out of it one of the most insanely large, spectacular spectacles that you could ever imagine in the world. My job as the storyteller in it would be to try to make that uh, not, just a, not just a drowning, heavy, show-off thing, but 
to make it in some way meaningful and charming, and I believe that could be done. Also there, I would have a chance to, to direct the film in the scenes where my friend Manuel would be playing. And Manuel is such a hog for scenes that that would mean I would direct nearly all of it. On the other hand, there is the possibility of writing a script of Moby Dick with John Huston. And there the problems are even more attractive in some ways. I think it's the, outside of Huckleberry Finn, the most beautiful piece of writing I know in American writing. One of the main problems would be to find a way of making a Shakespearean poem in a way that would be comprehensible to anyone who understood ordinary English. This I think Melville failed to do, and it would be my job to try to do in trying to write it for a ver the very large audience that Melville never wrote it for anyway. With that job, I would go to the south of France and then to Ireland. It's very hard for me to choose between those very attractive possibilities of first seeing any of the Orient at all and then seeing for the second time some of Europe. And then thinking of the people that I could see in Europe if I was there and of the new jobs that would come up there. Because Europe now in, in this particular world that I'm working in, 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 in movies, is, is absolutely reeking with jobs. It's quite unlike the West Coast in that way. But I would go first to a place on the Riviera called Saint-Jean-de-Luce, which is, if it has stayed the same, a run-down, very beautiful, quite glamorous, very sad little beach place. I guess close to the Italian shore, is it? I don't know. Then around late fall, we'll go back to Ireland. By back, I mean that's where John Houston has his family. We would go back there for Christmas. And uh, I suppose that Houston would try to ride Irish horses in the what must be by then very muddy weather there. <laughs> and that um, if the occasion arose, he would try to fight Irish men. And I certainly would not try that. Also, he would be in cahoots with another man named Peter Virtel, who wrote an extremely destructive novel about Houston, recently published. But he's now working on a Kipling story, whose title I'm dying to hear. Houston will be straddling between us, consulting with us about our stories, and uh, telling Peter Virtel how to write Kipling and me how to write Melville. <laughs> There are the added charms there that uh, Mia and the children could come over with us on a, an Arabian night kind of expense account, and that we could probably take our friend Mary. That would be at our own expense, but uh, there she'd be, and uh, Teresa has got to learn how to read somehow. And uh, if Mary did that kind of nominal teaching, that would be just about all. And aside from that, we would rent bicycles, and everybody but me would swim. So, uh, all all of this you'll, you you will know more about. But it means that right now I'm in such perplexity, and my stomach is like a fist. I really cannot make up my mind to anything. I wish that Mia could be here. I know that she would uh, accept that she's even shyer than I am at such a thing as speaking over a microphone. She would love to be able to speak with you. And she, is, she has often spoken of you and remembers with such happiness meeting you. You know, it's up in the country, so are the children. We have a menagerie up there by now. 
we have the third of black spaniel puppies. One died jumping out of a car, trying to cross the street to me as I went into a drugstore. One died happily licking up strychnine on a neighbor's farm this summer. Then we got a puppy who looks like Jack Dempsey. Oh, great, harmless, sweet-natured creature who last night began worrying something in the grass. Well, since he worries anything from a bed bug up, I paid no attention for quite a while. Then I realized that it was serious. I went out and I found that he was worrying, I was afraid to death, a baby rabbit. A really tiny one. He had so gobbled it over that I thought, well, oh, this is terribly hurt. He's dying. I, I must just uh, take this away and end its life as quickly as I can. And then I realized that this puppy is so ignorant that uh, he had only thought he was playing with something because he's bitten me by accident and broken the skin. And I realized what he could have done to this little creature if he had intended to hurt it. But he was only playing. I saw that the little rabbit's skin was not broken, though, though he was very weak. So I took him away and I put him in a strainer, a vegetable strainer, and locked him in the shed, put Christmas elsewhere, the dog. And I went back to him now and then. And sure enough, after about an hour, he was not lying down anymore. He, 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 he sat up. I don't mean on his hind legs as if he thought it was Easter, but just, uh, just sitting quiescent like a little rabbit should little round body and then a little round head on top of it with his ears laid very far back trembling like mad so I left him alone for a while longer I had the feeling by then that that uh, the worst that he might have suffered was was shock and I don't wonder and after a while I went out and brought him into the house and we wound up some milk and tried to give it to him through a uh, you know a medicine dropper and he babbled that he couldn't he couldn't catch on we held him upside down and forced it between his teeth and glutted him with half a spoonful of the stuff and he was awfully alarmed at it he'd also picked up enough life by then that every time you touched him he flinched and gave a great leap and fell over on his side and then was so frightened and so weak that he couldn't get on his feet again so we were still very disturbed for him but by the end of the evening, we felt, well, this is uh, it's unthinkable to, to uh, put an end to this. We'll just see how he, how he goes. And uh, we put him together with things warmly in a basket, took him in our bedroom, and uh, left him through the night. I got up now and then through the night, which is easy. I don't sleep in the night anyway. I go over to him, and uh, he was sitting there. I got great comfort of uh, realizing that rabbits really sit when they're asleep. They don't lie down. They, they just huddle up and all the different balances come together and they, they just lie down very comfortably that way. And uh, now and then I would touch him. And if he was asleep, he wouldn't even jump. If he was awake, he'd jump. He'd fall over. And I learned enough not to touch him again or stroke him or comfort him, but just stand there and watch him, talk to him a little bit. And he would slowly get back onto his feet and sit again like a rabbit. And in the morning when I had to go for the train, he seemed really very much better. He was sitting up pretty spry. And I, I, I told Mia, who felt awfully unsure and uneasy about it, just to... Uh, you know, by the middle of the day, try the milk again, and then shut herself in that room with the animals and children away who get wildly excited and frighten him to death. But just close herself in with the rabbit, and now and then just, just touch him, if nothing else made him move, and see whether he hopped right. And if he hopped right, to take him out about twilight tonight, 
and uh, where where he was caught, because I know there's a family of rabbits around there, and uh, that I believe that his brother would find him. And if you didn't hop right to take him to the veterinary, there's a very nice veterinary there who took care of our puppy earlier in the summer. Very generous and very kind man. Yeah. Uh, now there has been a lapse of several days. Uh, I had uh, finished off some rather feeble generalizations about veterinarians and how I like them as I like bakers and uh, farmers and not very many other people. Since then I've come back into town again and uh, things on the jobs that I spoke of have taken a new shape. The Moby Dick job is out for perhaps a year because the star they were counting on is signed up for something else. So that gets me off my dilemma and uh, I go on to a new one instead between the Philippine job and uh, one that I might do here in New York. The trouble on the Philippine job is that they deceived my friend Manuel until the deal was set and then decided that they didn't want him to star in the film. They want a well-known American star like Yul Brynner of The King and I. Well, now all of that remains to be worked out when Manuel comes back from Manila in a couple of weeks. And uh, James Wong Howe and I have uh, agreed that if uh, Manuel is treated in that way, neither of us will go on the film. So in that case, I may instead be working in New York for several months on a, on a story that I wrote last winter and which I will be able to direct here. That will be with my friends like Helen Levitt, who made The Quiet One. And much as I would like to go to the Philippines, that really in the long run might work out best. I don't know. I think now it's time to say goodbye for the time being. I really would like to, to, to write a letter. I'm awfully bad at doing that. But I hope I will. I believe I will during the fall or winter. And it's been awfully nice to talk to you. And uh, I hope maybe you will talk back on tape sometime soon. I want to send you my love. God bless you always.